Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to St. Vincent College. We're glad that you're here. This Threshold Lecture series began in 1981 to bring important speakers and topics to our region through a collaboration with the McKenna family, the Kenna Meadow Foundation, and St. Vincent. Thanks especially to the Clark family here present to remember and honor Dr. Ann Kinzer Clark with this memorial lecture series and to partner with The Threshold and the Latrobe Area Hospital Charitable Foundation. It is precisely through partnerships like these that we are able to bring prominent and poignant speakers to friends, neighbors, and scholars of our region, as well describes our speaker today. It was critically important to St. Benedict, our founder, 1,500 years ago to welcome all guests as Christ himself. That's chapter 53 from his holy rule, which we continue to follow today. We welcome each of you in that same regard, especially you, Dr. West. We particularly welcome Dr. Andrew Clark from Harvard University, and we look forward to welcoming him again in, in March when he brings the Harvard Glee Club right here to St. Vincent. He is the son of Doug and Ann Kinzer Clark and a good friend of St. Vincent, a music student who was probably on this stage once or twice. And I invite him today to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you and welcome. My name is Andrew Clark and, and I have the honor to introduce our guest speaker tonight. And on behalf of my family, Clark family, where's the Clark family? I just want to be sure. <laughs> I'm representing them tonight, yeah. We, um, um, we're grateful for your presence with us. I am who I am because somebody loved me. This is a message that our speaker often shares reminding first himself and others to remember, to reflect with appreciation and with piety, those who cared for us, who nurtured us, those who tolerated us, even when it wasn't easy. I am who I am because somebody loved me. Dr. West will say this again and again, most often in the context of the classroom. Cornell returned to Harvard in the spring of 2017, where he now serves as the professor of the public, uh, excuse me, professor of the practice of public philosophy at the Harvard Divinity School. Um, upon his return to Harvard at that point, um, I had been teaching there for a number of years and really didn't know it at the time, but was in need of certain amount of rejuvenation at a point of vocational crisis in my own life. So I snuck into one of his classes that first spring and a few more in subsequent years. And to be present, to bear witness to his electrifying lectures, as you'll soon experience, it's just something to behold. Completely reinvigorated and challenged me as a teacher and as an artist. So profoundly inspired by his intellectual breadth, his spiritual depth, his creative and critical mind, but most importantly, his joy. Rooted in honesty and compassion, each class was a rich odyssey on what he'd call the love train, a life-transforming education toward the maturation of the soul and the critical consciousness of the mind. I am who I am because somebody loved me. Another important figure reminded us of this in his life and work, our very own Fred Rogers, a native of La Trobe. And as we gather here tonight, just a few steps from the important work of the Fred Rogers Center, we might remember that moment late in Fred's life when he accepted that Lifetime Achievement Award at the Emmys in Hollywood in a big theater full of Hollywood celebrities and all the glitz and glamour that went along with it. If you remember that, you might remember that he invited that audience to take a moment, which he timed with his watch, 
to be silent and to reflect upon the people who invested their love and care in their own formation, in their own life's journey. And though I'm not going to make you go through that exercise tonight, um, I can say that for me, I am who I am um, because of my parents. My father, Doug, who's here tonight, and my late mother, Anne, whom we remember tonight with this lecture given in her blessed memory. Anne Kenzer Clark died on September the 1st, 1999. And some of you may have known her as her friend or her, uh, her patient, her family member, her acquaintance. And again, your presence with us tonight, even those who didn't know her, means a great deal to our family. And maybe in some mysterious way, she had a hand in my own clandestine visits to Dr. West's lectures, because like Cornell, I like to think that my mother was on fire in her own quest for truth, beauty, and goodness. She was feisty, curious, and caring. She would have loved this occasion tonight, as someone who never forgot where she came from and what this taught her about being a human and a force for good. On the 20th anniversary of her death last month, I took a moment and just grabbed a shoebox of old letters and photographs. Though she could certainly be sappy and sentimental, it struck me that a lot of her letters always seemed to reach a crescendo toward their closing, and that her final paragraphs usually finished with a variation on this theme. This was one letter I received my freshman year. She said, do not forget, son, that you come from a long line of strong women. <laughs> and their blood runs through your veins. There are plenty of tough genes in you. You may be out of sight, but you are in our hearts and prayers. I am who I am because somebody loved me. And how might we live into this truth? to conjure up those tough genes we all have, the love that shaped us. For my mother, the vehicle was often music. The arts, literature, theater, music, these were like an inheritance from her parents and grandparents, one that she aimed to bestow upon my brother and I. And this remarkable place, St. Vincent, played a pivotal role in our lives in this regard. You see, she would drag my brother and I here to this building, week in and week out, we would walk up the four flights of stairs for our routine reckoning, by that I mean our weekly piano lesson, with the late beloved Father Joseph Bronder. As a senior in high school, I left this very building after a piano lesson, knowing that I had to pursue music as my life's work. And it was in the Basilica, just a few steps from here, a few months before my mother's death, that we had a chance to sing Handel's Messiah during Eastertide, a work of art she not only loved as a Christian for the power of its message, but because she had to sit still as a toddler during performances of Messiah in Beckley, West Virginia, with her parents singing on stage. Days before that concert in the Basilica in 1999, she learned of her terminal diagnosis, and four months later, she was gone. Yet during her darkest hour, performing that beloved treasure transcended all else. And to this day, I'm haunted by the euphoric look in her eyes that afternoon. Proudly cherishing the moment, utterly and fearlessly assured of the music's timeless message. As Cornell boldly reminds and, inc and incessantly reminds his students, we have to learn how to die in order to learn how to live. And as I learned in Dr. West's course on the great James Baldwin, that we, in Baldwin's words, must earn our death by confronting the conundrum of life. We've asked our brother West to explore these ideas with us tonight. How a life in the arts, however we experience them, the work of art that is our life itself, can stir our souls toward compassion and keep track of our moral standards, fortify us in the face of despair, crisis, and death toward a vision of the world as it could be. 
Would you please give a warm Latrobe and St. Vincent welcome to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Cornell West. Blessing to be here tonight. <laughs> I want to thank each and every one of you for coming here tonight to be part of the celebration of the life and the legacy of our dear sister Anne Kinzer Clark. When I met her beloved son, Brother Andrew, and it's hard to find a Harvard faculty member who has that unique fusion of sharpness of mind and sweetness of spirit. <laughs> He's got a lot of analytical sharpness in Cambridge. <laughs> but when it comes to sweetness of spirit too, when I first met Andrew, I knew that he came from a spiritual nobility. And I knew I wanted to spend time with him. And he was kind enough to spend time with me. I would look up my lecture room, and there he is sitting in the back with that magnificent Clark smile. <laughs> so when he asked me to come and speak at this consecrated institution, St. Vincent, going back to 1846, of course, I salute the president, Paul Taylor. And I will be here in spirit at your inauguration. What a grand caretaker you are and will be of this institution. And where is my dear brother Douglas Nowinski? Where is he? Where is he? There he is. Give it up for this brother, 75 years young, still bearing witness. What a combination. What a grand combination. I was just interviewed by one of the students, the newspaper, and I was just deeply impressed by his brilliance and his dignity, he represents very well the student body here. But when Brother Andrew asked me to speak, I said, Brother, if we are having an event for your mother in Siberia, I am on the way. And then when I met Brother Doug, his father, just a few weeks ago, we broke bread. Oh, we had such a magnificent time, very much so. And it's so good to see you once again Mary Jo, what a blessing to see you, Patrick, just the whole Kinzer and Clark family. Give it up, give it up for both of them, just one more time, one more time. <laughs> no, indeed, indeed. When to meet Sister Amy, beloved wife of Brother Andrew, he talks about her all the time. I finally get a chance to give her a hug, and similarly so for the two Precious children, Amelia Grace and Eliza Jane. Oh, how blessed I am. Now, you all can see I'm in no rush tonight. <laughs> no, no. I know I'm on consecrated Catholic space, but I am Holy Ghost Baptist in spirit. <laughs> so I'm going, we're going to take our time tonight. And we're going to have question and answer. I'm here to follow the first word of the rule of Benedict that goes back almost 1,500 years, which is listen. I learned that from my brother today, <laughs> the arch habit. Listen. And of course, I've always considered myself a jazz man in the world of ideas and a blues man in the life of the mind. You can't be a jazz man or a blues man unless you learn how to listen. Cultivate the faculty of receptivity as well as giving back and forth. And there is such a sweet spirit in this place right now. And we know it has something to do with with Brother Fred Rogers. Now we have to give him credit. He, he cut so radically against the grain in his day. He represented a level 
of spiritual engagement when it, came, when it comes to integrity, honesty, generosity, care, love. There's no accident that the film is doing as well as it is doing. I'm sure many of you have seen the documentary. Is that right? Have many of you seen the documentary? You seen the documentary? Powerful. Very, very powerful. We want to see what Tom Hanks comes up with in a month and a half with the new film on Fred Rogers. But we know the spirit has much more to do with Fred Rogers, has to do with the degree to which each one of us acknowledge that we live in such a grim moment. A moment of not just polarization and balkanization, but in some ways a moment of spiritual collapse, moral meltdown. And it affects people of all colors, every gender, every sexual orientation. You see. It affects every region of the country. You see. We are in deep trouble, which means in many ways we need each other even more now than before. And the question becomes, do we have what it takes to cultivate not just the virtues and the values and the visions, but can we mobilize the best of our past so that it can be brought to bear, enacted and embodied in our lives, very much like part of the afterlife of our dear sister Anne Kinsey Clark, ought to be operative in our lives. So yes, I do want to begin with the acknowledgement, we all are who we are because somebody loves us, somebody cares for us, someone attends to us. But the question then becomes, how do we situate and locate ourselves in the best of the traditions that have been bequeathed to us to attempt to bear witness in such a grim moment? No one of us are in control of history. And certainly no one of us or no group is messianic and has some special access to a goodness that somehow can turn things around. All we have is our capacity to learn how to love, think, laugh, organize, mobilize, coordinate, coagulate, and hope that maybe by means of spiritual and moral awakening, we can turn things around. I'm told that the founder of this grand institution went down to Augusta, Georgia, 1869, and said, lo and behold, at a particular historical moment, let us bear witness. Not in the spirit of self-righteousness, but rather it's the best we fallen finite creatures can do in space and time to build on the best of what came before. That piety, and that piety is not uncritical deference to dogma, it's not blind obedience to doctrine, it is acknowledging the sources of good in our lives horizontally, and if you are Christian like myself, vertically as well. How do we enact the magnanimity of sweet surrender to something bigger than us that could tease out the best of us and connect that magnanimity to a sublimity of acknowledged dependence on those who came before and then the sheer majesty of joyful gratitude. We just lost brother Elijah Cummings. I didn't know he was that sick at all. It was just a few months ago that he was the head of the platform committee that I was asked to, to be a member of. And it was very kind of Elijah to ask me because I'm not a member of any political party. I'm a Christian. <laughs> so I'm in the world, but not of it. I wear all of these political parties like a loose garment. <laughs> oh, yes, I got a critical 
skepticism about all politicians, no matter what their rhetoric. Now, I like Bill Bradley very much. We were with Bradley in Iowa. But even with Bradley, we were critical. Across the board. People say, oh, you love Bernie. I love everybody. Yes, I love Bernie too, but I'm critical of Brother Bernie as well. What about Trump? Oh, I love Trump. I, Christa, I try, try, try to love everybody. <laughs> I believe in classical Christian hatred. <laughs> well, you hate to sin and steal, try to love the sinner. But you hate whatever injustice you perceive, but you still try to stay in contact with the humanity of the person because they're made in the likeness and image of the same God that you are. And they have the capacity to change, even if it looks like the evidence is not quickly kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> but what that does, of course, is shatter all forms of liberal self-righteousness. As if somehow you're coming in on some higher ground and looking down at the benighted. Don't you know the hypocrisy runs across the board? That's what it is to wrestle with the most terrifying query that each and every one of us will ever have to wrestle with, which is what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creature born between urine and feces? <laughs> That's who we are. You know, put on my three-piece suit if I want to in Harvard, Yale, Princeton. No, my body's headed to the culinary delight of terrestrial worms just like yours. <laughs> I don't care what color, I don't care where you live. It's an echo of line 38A of Plato's Apology. And the Socratic legacy of Athens is a necessary but not sufficient source for any kind of awakening that's worth its while. And that line 38A says the unexamined life is not worth living. And I can hear my precious Muslim brother Malcolm X saying, the examined life is painful. It's like when the beloved students come to this grand institution. I'm sure you tell them, welcome to St. Vincent's where you will be unsettled. <laughs> just come, just, just come, come, come. You're going to be unhoused. You're going to be unnerved. Because you, yes, have something to bring. But you also need to be challenged. You need to learn how to think critically for yourself. There's a very good chance you've come in as an echo, as an extension of a particular echo chamber of the silo in which you grew up. And I come from a people, black people, whose national anthem is what? Lift every Voice, not echo. Every voice. And we want the precious students at St. Vincent to say, well, yes, there's a rich tradition. Yes, St. Benedict has so much to offer. But so does Socrates. So does Gandhi. So does agnostics like James Baldwin. So does Stephen Sondheim. I wish I could give a lecture on Sondheim, but I've got to come back for another occasion. <laughs> what genius, what courage, what willingness to cut against the grain, but come back to that terrifying question, what does it mean to be human in our particular skin, in your unique, singular, irreducible, irreproducible self and your voice is like your fingerprint just like a jazz musician you can't be a jazz musician if you don't find your voice Coltrane quit imitating Johnny Hodges and the Duke Ellington band Aretha Franklin how come you keep imitating Marion Williams that's what James Cleveland told her all of the great artists 
So you got to find your voice, find what is in the dark corners of your own soul, transfigure your suffering and your despair in such a way that you learn how to empty yourself, give yourself, donate yourself, serve others such that you enable and empower them. And that's very much the best of my own tradition as black people. Because I come from a black folk who have been hated for 400 years and yet taught the world so much about love. I could just turn on John Coltrane's Love Supreme right now and sit down <laughs> and let you take it in. I turn on Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Now I know that might be a little too, too much uh, rhythm and blues for some of y'all in terms of the, uh, the year itself. So let's go back to Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong and a little Ella Fitzgerald. Same tradition. Same self-emptying, same flow of love mediated with unbelievable mastery of craft and technique because it's Socratic in terms of the self-interrogation, but at the same time is tied to something so much deeper than simply criticism or feeling good about putting others in their place. It's about how do you learn how to build other people up based on the gifts that you have and gifts that you're willing to cultivate. That's what we learn, love about Fred Rogers. It's as if he was just reading from Kierkegaard's works of love, where Kierkegaard says so explicitly, and Kierkegaard, of course, is a Lutheran, so we're going to keep this ecumenical. <laughs> <laughs> Very self-styled, iconoclastic, iconoclastic, idiosyncratic Lutheran, but still Lutheran. And he says quite explicitly, he says love is not only a building up, but it's a learning how to deal with what our Jewish brothers and sisters said in Leviticus 19, love thy neighbor as thyself. And a Palestinian Jew named Jesus builds on it. And to love your neighbor is to be a neighbor to others regardless of who they are. It's not Loving thy neighbor, except those folk on this side of town, except those folk with these political views, except those folk who are, have an allegiance to this set of beliefs. It is profoundly subversive. I would say it's revolutionary. That's one of the great gifts of Hebrew scripture to the world. It's revolutionary. To be human at its deepest level is to spread hesed, steadfast, loving kindness to everyone, but especially the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the motherless, the vulnerable, the weak, the oppressed, the persecuted, the marginalized, those pushed to the periphery. The unprecedented breakthrough in the history of the species. And yet we know it is uphill every generation and shall forever be uphill every generation. Because given who we are, what constitutes who we are, so much the fears and insecurities and anxieties, especially having bodies which will be extinct in a few decades that generates deep anxiety. And the question becomes, how do you filter your wrestling with those fears, anxieties, insecurities in such a way that it has something to do with the hesed? And that's why the juxtaposition of the Socratic legacy of Athens and the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem is so important for us these days. Because in light of the spiritual collapse, which goes far beyond the political, far beyond the economic. And the political and the economic are very important, but they are not all important. There's a spiritual dimension that is irreducible to either. And when we look back at the best of what those before have to give us. Because see, I grew up in a West family very much like the Clark family. See, my father passed 25 years ago. I'll never be the human being he was. I fall so short. 
It's like Samuel Beckett, try again, fail again, fail better. And all I can do is fail better in relation to Clifton West. My mother's still going, 87 years young. Just there two weeks ago celebrating her life, Irene B. West Elementary School, named after her. But that's not the important thing. It's what they passed on by means of example, not even just by utterances, but by deed, planting the seed inside of me. And so yes, when I went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and so forth, I said to myself, these are tertiary in terms of the honor of being the second son of Irene and Clifton. <laughs> Let's just keep our priorities right. It's, it's a gift. I didn't even ask. Given to me. What are you going to do with it, Brother West? I'm going to try to bear witness. Now, it may be the case that I spent a little bit more time on TV than mom. So what? in terms of wrestling with what is coming at us, spiritually, politically, economically, culturally. The courage required, the determination necessary is the same for each and every one of us. One of the most important distinctive features of the past of the West and the West is no monolithic entity. There's a variety of different streams and strands in the West. But with Socrates on one side, Amos and Esther, and Jesus and Mohammed on the other. What is most important for us today is the acknowledgement that yes, learning how to live in order to learn how to die interrogating assumptions in such a way that when we give them up, that's a form of death. When you give up a prejudice, that's a form of death. There's no education without interrogating and giving up certain assumptions and moving into broader horizons. Deeper attunements with the world in the old School language, learning how to grow up. You know, F. O. Matheson, one of the great Harvard professors, he was a Christian socialist. He wrote a classic in 1941 called The American Renaissance on, on Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. He used to begin his classes at Harvard. Will America be, be unique among modern nations to move from perceived innocence to corruption without a mediating stage of maturity? And the student would say, hmm, this is going to be an interesting class. <laughs> <laughs> Every nation we know is rooted to some form of barbarism. Every nation we know has got corruption. Every nation we know uses arbitrary power no matter how many stories they tell about themselves. There's differences between these nations, but as long as you've got human beings around, you're going to have various forms of corruption. The great Rana Honeber used to say, democracy is a proximate solution to insoluble problems. That's the best human beings can do. How do you have mechanisms of accountability for arbitrary power when it comes to wealth, when it comes to resources, when it comes to status? And the best thing we have been able to come up with is some ways in which democratic procedures and processes provide some kind of way of answerability for arbitrary power. Plato argued a long time ago in probably the most profound text ever written in the history of the West, and it was the first text written in the history of the West in regard to philosophy. In Republic, he says what? Show me a democracy and I'll show you a tyranny in the making. Because Plato was very honest. He said, everyday people, and then the language just slides down. <laughs> he said, they shot through with so much unruly passion and pervasive ignorance that they're too gullible and they'll always be manipulated by a tyrant and a despot and an autocrat. The most profound figure in many ways as radically democratic as one could imagine, 
That's why Plato is important. Because you must wrestle with him and because he's wrong. <laughs> At least in my view, because I'm a Democrat, small d. But he's a skeleton hanging in any closet of somebody concerned about keeping a democracy alive, given its fragility, given just how difficult it is. Because if you don't have ways of dealing with unruly passion and pervasive ignorance, then it will generate despotism. It will generate autocracy or in modern language of various forms of fascism. And this is precisely why talk about education is in no way simply a talk about how your STEM programs are doing. The science, the technology, mathematics. Yes, very important indeed. I'm looking at my dear sister Aspasia, she's a young, young student. Yes, indeed, nothing against the engineers. But if those engineers are not wrestling with what it means to be human, they're gonna end up managerial and technical, but still spiritually vacuous and not having enough moral courage to come to terms with what it means to be human. Even engineers are human. We gotta remind folk. <laughs> Even STEM folk are human. You see. And in a democracy, you gotta have citizens. You don't just have consumers and managers. And it's not about smartness and money. For the last 15 years in my classes, the students come in, I wanna be the smartest in the room. I'm not impressed. <laughs> Let the phones be smart, you be wise. <laughs> so uh, there's a whole lot of smart Nazis. Goebbel wasn't a fool. A lot of smart white supremacists, a lot of smart male supremacists. A lot of smart folk who hate, a lot of smart folk who dominate. Something else got, has to be at work. That's where the spiritual and the moral come in, in a fundamental way. And yes, it's true. When you look back at the history of the United States, you know, what Ethel Matheson had in mind was, here is this grand opportunity to create something unprecedented in the modern world, which is a multiracial, multicultural, multigender democratic experiment. But was predicated on indigenous people's land. You can't live in denial. You've got institutions of slavery, 244 years and almost 90 years under the U.S. Constitution. Look at the U.S. Constitution, see no reference to the institution of slavery. You're going to end up fighting one of your most barbaric civil wars of modern times over an institution not invoked in your Constitution. What does that mean? It means you're living in denial. You got to grow up. To grow up means to mature. To mature means to learn how to die that the innocence that we often cling to is itself a kind of crime because it rationalizes the denial. Same is true with male supremacy. We're the grandest democracy of all time. Well, when could the vast majority of citizens vote who are women? Well, 1920, it took a while. 1776 to 1920, but we're on the cutting edge. We just slowed down. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Just be honest about yourself. No one of us are pure or pristine. It's the quality of the effort and the attempt to push back whatever forces are losing sight of the humanity of people. And that's what's difficult. That's one of the reasons why so many of our writers and our thinkers go back to the Russians. It's no accident that the greatest novelistic artists in the modern world come from Russia. Dostoevsky, Brothers Karamazov, Crime and Punishment, The Devils, Turgenev, Fathers and Sons, Tolstoy, Anna Karenina, War and Peace. And, and he hates the fact that he wrote both of those because he changed his conception of art, he became a thoroughgoing moralistic thinker. But what was it about the Russians there was a lot about the Russians, and my favorite of all time, the medical doctor, 
Anton Chekhov himself. There's no accident that Chekhov's plays are the most popular in our age. We live in the age of Chekhov. Artists as prophetic witness. What is it about the Russians? The Russians do not begin by conceiving of themselves as innocent. They start with Peter the Great. Oh, my God. <laughs> Catherine the Great. Oh, Lord. What is it about these folk? They are up front. We are not a beacon of liberty or freedom. We're subordinating these serfs and these slaves, and we're making the world safe for our aristocracy and nobility. And if they get out of line, they undergo repression, too. Did we make ourselves clear? Which just means they begin with catastrophe. This is very important. We as Americans, we like to begin with problems. Oh, we've got a, a Negro problem. What does that problem consist of? Well, we've had slavery where they had the labor exploited from sunrise to sun up and the women were violated and raped and created different colors and they had no rights and liberties. We had a Negro problem. That's not a problem. That's a catastrophe. <laughs> Don't confuse the problematic with the catastrophic. But we're problem solving people. Maybe. But what do you do with your catastrophes? How come your working class didn't have the right to engage in collective bargaining until 1936, but Argentina did in 1836, and Argentina is not known for being a country on the cutting edge of social justice? <laughs> oh, the rule of the bosses are so strong. The workers are an extension of our property. No, they're not. They're human beings just like everybody else. You see, that's not a problem of the working for working classes people. That's a certain catastrophe visited on. There's never been a woman's problem in America. Catastrophes visited on women. You're less intelligent. You're an extension of my property. You see. And dot, dot, dot. Russians begin with catastrophe. We live in this age of overwhelming polarization but also an age of catastrophe. Ecological catastrophes, not a narrow problem to be solved. It's a catastrophe, catastrophe which must be met on a number of different levels. Nuclear catastrophe, that's not a problem. Economic catastrophe. 1% of the population owned 42% of the wealth when I was the age of students. 1% of the population owned 21% of the wealth. Because our working classes were able to gain access to wage increases when profits went up. That has not been the case in the last 45 years. You see? And what does that result in? Unbelievable suffering of working people. I don't care what color they are. Wage stagnation for 40 years. And yet the prices go up and productivity is quadru quadrupled four times. What is going on? That's catastrophe. Political catastrophe. The sheer mediocrity of our political class. And I would argue in both parties, but that's a separate uh, election. I'm not here to proselytize tonight. But I can proselytize when I get on the soapbox. <laughs> but I'm not doing it tonight. <laughs> but what I'm talking about is where are the states People, that's what we talked about with Bill Bradley's campaign. We don't want garden variety politicians in the middle of multiple catastrophes. We're looking for states persons who have cultivated their conception of a public good, who have cultivated their conception of how you think prudentially, not opportunistically. Nothing wrong with compromising when it is informed by vision and integrity and principle, but you're just leaping to the next opportunity and listening to the next poll to discover what your deepest convictions are. You are leading your people off a cliff. And so you end up with politicians who are, for the most part, thermometers. Just Check and see what their convictions are in light of what the polls say. Polls shift, they shift. 
Where are the thermostats who are shaping the climate of opinion, who are cutting against the grain, who are saying what they mean and mean what they say, even if they're wrong? Socrates says in line 24a of the Plato's Apology, he says, parhesia was the cause of my unpopularity. What is parhesia? P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. It's frank speech, plain speech, fearless speech, unintimidated speech. We must have spokespersons at the local state, regional, national, and international level who say what they mean and mean what they say rather than pose and posture and say something that is just popular with whatever constituency in which they find themselves. That's opportunistic. Prudence goes back to the Aristotelian conceptions of phronesis, practical wisdom. We all are in circumstances not of our own choosing, and of course we must compromise. But will it be informed by spiritual and moral resources so that we do not lose sight of the humanity of the people we are disagreeing with and recognize that there's possible overlap on a host of other issues, but we're all ways attempting to ascend to something grander, much grander. And it is no accident that it has been the artist who in many ways have been the vanguard of the species when it comes to this. Levels of vision, courage, integrity, willingness to make contact with the humanity of folk right across the board. When I walked in today and I was given a magnificent portrait of myself with Brother Raphael. Where's my Brother Raphael? Oh, there he is right there. Yes, that magnificent portrait you made of me. And given the raw material you had to work with, you did an unbelievable job. <laughs> You see, but automatically he made connection with my human. I said, oh my God, but this is what art at its best is all about. Let's go to the dark root of our screams as human beings that shudder that Faust talks about in the realm of the mother. To be human is to shudder, Goethe says. He or she who has never despaired has never lived, Goethe says. And yet the artists go on to say what? Let us authorize an alternative reality in light of the nightmare in which we find ourselves. And that's what all the great artists do of every culture. I'm talking primarily about the West. It's no accident that the greatest painter of modern times to this day, Rembrandt, died in the latter part of the 1600s, the 17th century. What was it about Rembrandt who died, pushed to the margins, in debt, siding with the subjugated community of his day in Amsterdam, the Jewish brothers and sisters, putting up on the canvas the Menachem Israel, the teacher of the great Spinoza who had been excommunicated in his own Jewish community. What was it about Rembrandt? It was his willingness to connect to something bigger than him and then to authorize a reality that allowed for a deep connection. Brother Doug just gave me the book, The Return of the Prodigal Son that sits in the Hermitage in Russia. Written by Henry Nguyen, probably the greatest painter that, uh, painting that I know of. Ramir Bearden, in some ways the American version of Rembrandt, doing what? Staying in contact with the humanity of the person portrayed, even the 71 portraits of himself. Changing over time, showing the depths of his passions his fears, his incongruities, and connecting with those who have the courage to stay in contact with his genius on the canvas, no matter how it might violate the rules of Baroque art, which it did, which, it did, which made him very unpopular for 
so long. That's one reason why it's hard for me to not talk about Sondheim. Sondheim wasn't appreciated in his day. Sunday in the park with George, what did they say about that? What did they say about company? What did they say about passion? What did they say about Sweeney Todd? It's too dark, it's too grim. It's, uh, we, we, we like Oklahoma. <laughs> June is busting out all over. <laughs> Sondheim says, come in to Sweeney Todd space. I'm going to flip this genre upside down. Come into part two of Into the Woods. Not living happily thereafter, but when Cinderella finds the prince, marries the prince, and then says, is that all there is? <laughs> that wonderful line in that second part where he says, wishes come true but not free. There's a cost. There's a risk. There's something you've got to pay even when your grandest dream comes true. And so it is even in the history of America. The history of the American dream. Of course we all want resources. Of course we want to work, live in neighborhoods that are safe. Of course we want quality jobs. Of course we want wages that are fair. But we want a whole lot of other things, too. And our great Tennessee Williams, who wrote one of the most magnificent essays. I have my students read this year in and year out. It's called The Catastrophe of Success. This is after the Glass Menagerie, 1947. He says, all my early years, I wanted to be the most successful playwright in all of America. Move aside, Eugene O'Neill. I'm coming through. Come on, Arthur Miller. You can come with me if you like. <laughs> and then he achieves it. And what happens? A certain vacuity sets in. A certain emptiness sets in. And you go back to Socratic legacies of Athens, prophetic legacies of Jerusalem, and say, yes, success is in no way synonymous with greatness. And one of the worst things we've done in the last 40 years is tell our precious young folk that life is a matter of being highly successful rather than have an habitual vision of greatness and what the Greeks call arate, spiritual and moral excellence. And you can be successful, but what are you going to use your success for? Probably the most powerful indictment ever written in America. Arts as prophetic witness in the time of suffering and despair of Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh. And I'm sure many of you have seen and read and wrestled with that play. And we teach that play every year. Wherever I am, wherever I am. And it's a play about what happens when a person gains the world and loses their soul. What happens when a nation conquers the world and loses its soul. That is no cliche. That is no empty biblical shibboleth. It's lived. And that's what O'Neill was wrestling with after the Nobel Prize, knowing he was the most towering artist of the stage, but knowing at the same time that he was after greatness. Greatness. And even as an agnostic and an anarchist, O'Neill was still rooted in some of the best of the West because he understood, in fact, that greatness had something to do with the quality of his relationships with others, the depth of his love to, toward others, and the service rendered to others. Crucial. Oh, we need this so badly today, and especially exemplified to the younger generation. Don't look at me as Harvard professor on TV as a celebrity market driven icon so successful living so well in some vanilla suburb. Don't look at me as a peacock strutting around showing how smart and rich 
I can hear my grandmother saying, peacock strut because they can't fly. <laughs> and when you fly, you got a certain sense of nobility and royalty of a spiritual and moral sort, but keeps track of those below, especially the least of these, those in prison, those in the hood, on the reservation, in the barrio, our poor white brothers and sisters in Appalachian, West Virginia, and not just here, but around the world. But a Muslim life has exactly the same value as a Christian life or a Buddhist life or a Hindu life or an agnostic life, which means a life in Iraq, Iran, a life in Pakistan and Afghanistan, a life in Indonesia has exactly the same value as a life in Paris, London, Latrobe. <laughs> oh yes, we're gonna bring Latrobe in here. Indeed, indeed, and those three towering Latrobes I think of, Arnold Palmer, ooh, yes. <laughs> Fred Rogers, ooh, my dear brother, another grand Latrobian, yes you are. You have done something unprecedented in the history of Harvard in the terms of the work that you've done as professor, in terms of the work you've done as Harvard Glee Club head, as, as the work you've done with the Radcliffe Choral Society, the work you've done with the groups, and I go to rehearsals, and I try to sing in tune. But I can see not just the love and the attention, but the exemplification of excellence and greatness. This is not about success. And Harvard is the bastion of success in America. But it can be empty. It can be sounding brass and tinkling cymbal if it does not have spiritual content and moral substance in that regard. And you see, as a blues man, Blues has always been about catastrophe. The blues ain't nothing but a narrative about personal catastrophe lyrically expressed. That's what it is. The king of the blues, B.B. King. Nobody loves me but my mama and she might be jiving too. <laughs> That's catastrophic. That's like Sophocles' Antigone, isn't it? You have nothing to rely on whatsoever. And the one person you thought you could depend on, she's looking at you and saying, you must be kidding. <laughs> That's catastrophe. Strange fruit the southern trees bear that Billy Holiday sang about with such power and the Jewish brother Maripol writing the lyrics. That's American terrorism. That's not just segregation. Let's not deodorize the reality. We're gonna keep it funky in La Trobe tonight. That's lynching. That's arbitrary power. That is catastrophic. That's not a problem. That's a catastrophe. What you gonna do with that catastrophe? That's the history of the best of black people. In the face of good morning heartache, in the face of B.B. King's wrestling with catastrophe, he's gonna come out on the stage with a smile, with style, with a little help from Lucille. And he's gonna touch your soul so deeply that you're gonna feel as if you're in a different reality when you leave than when you started. Because he's gonna cultivate the depths of his own soul and transfigure it in such a way that you're gonna be built up. You're gonna be uplifted. Your humanity will be affirmed. That's a blues people at their best. And there's no accident that in the history of this country, when America is right on the edge, about to go under, just like the Civil War, and 200,000 black folk join the Union Army in a multiracial army to break the back of the Army of the Confederacy, or in the civil rights movements in the 1960s. Here comes Martin Luther King Jr. Here comes Ella Baker. Here comes Fannie Lou Hamer. What are they talking about? They're on the love train. Okay. Bull O'Connor is a human being just like everybody else. He teaches Sunday school every Sunday, but he facilitates the killing of those four precious black babies in Birmingham, and he therefore must be accountable, but he's not demonized, he is rendered accountable. Where do you get that kind of power to love? 
Stevie Wonder the same way, Ray Charles the same way. We can go on and on and on. And this is not all black people. There's no such thing as the black perspective. Let's be very clear about that. Because there's a history of black gangsters and black thugs, just like there's a history of black upper thugs and gangsters in any community. And that's why I get in a lot of trouble a lot of times, because when I go at my dear brother, Brother Donald Trump and call him a gangster. People say, you shouldn't call him a gangster. He's the president. I said, well, when you're grabbing a woman's private part, that strikes me as gang. When, when, you, when you engage in arbitrary power, that strikes me as gangster. But I recognize that I was a gangster before I met Jesus. I'm just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> I'm talking about something inside of me. He's on a human continuum just like me. He has to reconquer it every day. If he doesn't, the gangster proclivity is going to overflow. That's true for each and every one of us. So it's not a matter of some kind of condescension. We human beings are wretched creatures, but we're also wonderful. We are walking disasters, but we have the capacity of what the great Henrik Ibsen called miracles. That's what Laura was waiting for Torval in a doll's house. I was waiting for a miracle, Torval, and you fell on your face. Goodbye. <laughs> Got to go. She, she thought he at least had the potential, making that human connection. But it's mediated, and I'll end this. It's mediated by something that you don't find in Socrates. And this is why Socrates is necessary, but in the end, insufficient. Socrates, who never wrote a word, just like Jesus, so we, what we know about him comes through Plato and Xenophon and Aristophanes in the clouds. But he never sheds a tear in any of the narratives about him. He never cries. When he's about to die and his wife Xanthippe comes in with the three boys, and she's crying, he says, no, you got to get away. I can't stand those tears. He says, hmm, what's going on? The great Thomas More raised the question in the Tower of London right before he was executed by Henry VIII, the grand Catholic brother that Thomas More was. Best of friends with one of my favorites, Erasmus, and praise the Father. He said, how could it be that Socrates never cries? Because anybody who goes through life wrestling with what it means to be human and never sheds a tear, never really loves anybody. You can love wisdom in the abstract. You can love principles. You can love philosophy as a discipline. But anybody who loves people, it's going to shed a tear. It's not a compliment if you don't shed a tear at your mother's funeral in front of her coffin. I'm talking about inner tears as well as outside. It doesn't have to always be externally expressed. But something is broken. Something shattered. Socrates is obsessed with self-mastery, so obsessed with self-control. Tears for him always signify something that he has no control over. Socrates, there are circumstances and conditions under which your wrestling with what it means to be human means it's all right to cry. And this is one of the great contributions of the legacy of Jerusalem. The weeping of Jeremiah. Jesus weeping for Lazarus and Jerusalem. Jesus wept. Tears, sorrow, also tears of joy. Those tears are the raw stuff of the great artists, in my humble opinion. That's what Beethoven's wrestling with in Opus 131 in the most unprecedented expression of the sonic sound in the string quartet. Seven movements rather than just four or five. What are you dealing with, Ludwig? We know you can't hear anything. We know you're about to go under. It's the next to last thing you write before you die. Tears flowing, connecting. Us, as human beings, as human primates, as persons made in the image and likeness of God. And then Shelley, in that last line of defense of poetry, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And by poets, he doesn't mean versifiers. 
He means artists in the broadest sense, any human being who uses their imagination and empathy to conceive of something better than the present, it could be manifest in their lives. They become artists of living, which is the very thing that Shakespeare ends his grand career at 47 years old and goes off retirement for five years and dies at 52. What does he say in the Tempest? All those who in fact have thought I was just talking about words and don't recognize that when I talk about paideia, when I talk about parhesia, I'm talking about a transformation in your life in such a way that your life becomes more courageous, more critical, more, in fact, upbuilding of others. You become an artist of life, not just an artist of tone or artist of word or artist of, on the canvas. So when we talk about art in that way, it, it embraces all the engineers, the mathematicians, the doctors, as well as the painters, as well as the playwrights, as well as the musicians. That's the challenge. And that's why art must never ever be viewed in an ornamental or decorative way. It's constitutive of who we are, especially in dealing with our tears because the moans and groans that emerge in the face of our grief is objectified and expressed in our art so that we have what it takes to persevere, to have stamina, to be determined, to not give in and cave in and give up and sell out as we hold on to integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, and then pass it on to the younger generation. And we do it in joy. It's not a burden. What I love about Brother Andrew is you just see the smile when he's dealing with these students at Harvard. And it's, we got some students at Harvard who are a challenge. So they're brilliant as they can be, they're wonderful and so forth, but he's got more patience than I do off sometimes. <laughs> but it's a joy. And that joy is not reducible to pleasure. So many young people these days, culture is really a joyless quest for insatiable pleasure. They get all the stimulation and titillation in the world and their souls are still empty. They haven't, the care and nurture is not in place, you see. It's not enough family, it's not enough civic institutions bombarded by violent images manipulative images of the media apparatus, not just social media, but film and so forth and so on. Where will they get it? Only in examples that they see in St. Vincent, they see at Harvard, they see in the mosque, they see in the temple, they see in the synagogue, they see in the church, they see in the barbershop, they see in the beauty salon. And, and to the degree to which they see it less and less and less and less is the degree to which it becomes more and more totally alien to them. I've been blessed to teach in prisons for 37 years. Some of my highest pedagogical moments have been in those prisons. I was just an MC1 Concord just two weeks ago, but I usually spend time in Norfolk where Malcolm X was outside of Boston. And one of the real challenges of so many of the precious brothers there in prison is you can just see them wrestling with how to love. How to love. Love themselves properly, not egotistically. Love truth in quest. Never possess it, but in quest of it. Love beauty. Love goodness. And I'm usually bearing witness as a Christian. So I'm telling them, I love God. I love the holy as mediated through the various stories and narratives and biblical traditions, you see. And that's one of the ways in which a crack vessel like me tries to make it from mama's womb to tomb. You see. But there's a variety of traditions to deal with this. But sooner or later, you've got to come to terms with denialism the meaninglessness, the hopelessness, the lovelessness, and you've got to hit it head on. And you're gonna to have to have some stories, some narratives that get you out of your egocentric predicament. 
And do we have what it takes? It's always an open question. In the history of this nation, it usually takes the form of new waves of spiritual, moral, political, economic awakening. That's what's kept this fragile experiment in democracy alive. And we're gonna to have to see whether we have the prophetic bounce back in the face of the spiritual collapse and the political and economic meltdown. But no matter what, we got to be like blues folk. You got to go down swinging like Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington. And by swinging, I'm talking about it don't mean a thing <laughs> if it ain't got that swing. And in that swing, there's got to be love. And justice is what love looks like in public. Just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. And we've got to be a more just-seeking, tender people, sweet people, kind people, but also determined people with moral tenacity to say, the truths that I speak are not going to be dictated by whatever popularity I get. That's crucial. You got a witness to bear. You got a voice to put forward. You got a vocation, not just a profession. You got a calling, not just a career. And if, in fact, we can generate new waves of the kind of awakening that we need, we'll have a chance. But we shall see. Thank you all so very much. You're very kind. Very kind. Very kind. That's what you're going to